right, everyone, welcome. We're doing a Kestrel training class tonight. Um, it's geared more towards the basic and beginner, but I'm definitely going to go as deep as we have time for tonight. Um, those of you that, who have not met me before, um, it's probably very few, but I will give you at least a little bit of background because this is going to get recorded and other people might watch it. Um, I've been competing for the last three and a half years in the PRS. Um, I've basically stuck to the PRS. And um, last year, I finished 19th in the Pro Series in the nation and second in the Great Lakes, um, actually the Midwest region. And um, I say that only to say that I have a ton of experience with this particular device. Um, I may not know everything that you guys have questions about tonight, but I have direct contact with the team at Applied Ballistics and Kestrel in case there's things that I can't answer. If you guys feel like uh, I, I explained something and you understood it differently, definitely raise your hand, uh, make a comment on the side here, and I will either explain to you why um, what I said was correct, or I'll agree with you and say, okay, maybe I, I'm not totally sure, and we'll get to the bottom of it. We'll, we'll sidebar it and we'll come back to it. But definitely don't hesitate to stop me and ask questions while we're on a topic, because I feel like um, if we got to come back to it, and reopen a particular area, it might take us longer. So I'm gonna to try to go fast in the areas that are relatively simple, and then I'll slow down and, and make sure you guys have time to ask the questions if there's things that are more in depth and harder to understand. Uh, the other thing I wanna say is Applied Ballistics has grace, graciously uh, donated three things to give away tonight. They have their full media bundle, which is behind me here. Uh, it's five hardcover, super awesome books and four DVDs. And so we're going to give away two full packs tonight. And then we're going to also give away a third item, which is uh, the Applied Ballistic T-shirt, which I'm pretty sure it's this one right here. All right. Oh, okay. It's the one Amanda's got on. So it's dark blue with white letters. It's almost as cool as this one. Yeah, right. I don't have any more of those. <laughs> okay. I really like this one, but I have that one too, and I like it as well. Um, okay, so like I said, if you guys have questions, ask in the chat window and I'll answer. Um, I have one of these devices. I've had one since day one when I started uh, three and a half years ago. Um, it is, if you guys have it, hopefully you do. Uh, it is the single most important device that you could show up to the range with. And it, it is going to give you the capability to get first round impacts at long distances. And uh, I want to say if you have it you made a good choice. If you don't, uh, hopefully watching this today will show you what its capabilities are. Uh, I'm not trying to sell you one. All I'm saying is that it's worth its weight in gold. Um, as a shooter, as a gunsmith, a mechanical engineer, somebody who thinks about the, the difficulty it is to, it takes to predict how a bullet's trajectory is gonna act in environmental conditions, varied environmental conditions. And um, then you throw it to the, the mix, different bullets and, and different twist rates and all that stuff. It's not something that's easy to understand, but Applied Ballistics has done all the hard work for us. And it is a really, really powerful device. So hopefully at the end of this, you'll either feel 100% confident. I mean, the, the goal of this training hopefully is that you guys show up to the range and you feel 100% confident in this device. Um, if you if you don't, then reach out to me and make sure that I get you squared away because when I showed up to the match last weekend, um, I immediately went to the farthest target and it was 934 yards. There was a seven mile an hour wind at eight o'clock. Um, I measured it with the Kestrel and I put it within three inches of where I was aiming at 933 yards. So it is possible. I hear a lot of people um, say that they have difficulties with it and usually it's user inputs. So I wanna make sure we go through all of the inputs today and then get as far as we can. Um, like I said, I'll answer as much as I can, but if I don't know, um, I'll I'll definitely tell you, and we'll we'll get to the bottom of it. So I'm going to go over here to the side and let me know if you guys can't see this, but I'm hoping that it's pretty easy to come across. Um, the first thing I want to do is go through a couple of is a couple of system. Can you still hear me? Is she? Yes. Yes. Okay. Because um, I only have audio on my computer. Um, I want to go over a couple of systems items in the Kestrel. So the first thing I do when I turn this thing on, let's turn it on from scratch here. 
you're going to see the version of the software, which is important. So what I'll say is when you guys are updating your firmware, make sure you have 30 minutes or so to do so and that your phone is plugged in and that it doesn't uh, get disrupted. You might have to reboot and redo the system settings if that happens, but you always want to have the most current firmware. And I will say, don't update the firmware. If you're going to a match, wait until after the match, just in case there's any issues with the firmware update. But I'm always going to um, update the firmware when there's an option because usually it's for the best. So you see the firmware flash, you see the battery percentage, and this is what it looks like from scratch. Um, I'm going to go down to system setup here. And one of the most important thing you, things you can do, sorry, this gear in the corner. So I'll push the gear, go all the way down to system, is calibrate your compass. So you can mess with the date and time and a bunch of other things in here, but I'm really just gonna touch on the items that really matter when you show up for a match. Uh, this compass calibration is very important. So every time I go to a match, if I'm driving across the country flying, even if I put this Kestrel in my backpack, drove home and came back to the range, I'm gonna calibrate the, the compass. It's very simple. You just push this center button and it's just as it says, you're gonna rotate it on its axis. I'm not gonna do it so we don't waste 30 seconds, but you're gonna to wanna to hold it as vertical as possible for that 30 seconds, slowly rotate it. What that's doing is that's calibrating the inter internal um, sensor inside this and it will say calibration complete when it's done. I'm sure that you guys have probably done that before, but I did not want to um, leave that out. The other thing down here that I'll make a comment on is the battery. Make sure you have it on lithium battery. If you're using a lithium or alkaline battery, that'll just help the battery display show the right percentage. There's definitely some concerns on whether that percentage is correct, but I can tell you that it's going to be a lot closer if you use the proper battery. And I would always recommend a lithium battery because it's going to have less of a chance to corrode inside here. This thing is sealed. This device is made to actually be fully submerged underwater. Um, the only thing that could be a problem is if you look in here, if this little white sensor starts touching that side of that plastic, you're going to have to clean this thing out and... I would take something like a toothpick or something and just make sure it's not touching that side wall. Um, as long as there's an air gap, you're good. So that's all I want to say about that. Don't go messing with it if it's, uh, if it's fine. The other thing we're going to talk about here is the three different modes. So we're going to go up, push this gear button. Sorry, this is hard to navigate on the screen here. You got ballistics mode, you got easy mode, which is about, I think it goes out to about 600 yards and it just simplifies all the inputs and then you got weather mode. So Kestrel was originally created as a standalone weather device. The ballistics mode was added in when um, applied ballistics started a relationship with them. Um, I always leave my, my Kestrel on ballistics mode, but there is some interesting stuff if you go to weather and you can get trend data for density altitude um, or any of the inputs for that matter. You can capture wind and get your high min max levels and it doesn't necessarily show that to you in ballistics mode. So that's about the only time when I'll go back over and, and check the weather mode. Um, so I guess the very next thing I'm thinking about if this device is new to you is how do I set up a gun profile in my Kestrel? So I'm going to show you guys how to set up a gun profile and all the steps you'll need to do on the device itself. And then I'm also going to show you how to do it in the app. So I'm assuming you guys all have this Kestrel with the link. And if you, have, if you don't have a Kestrel, I highly recommend you buy the one with the link because then you can back up your stuff back and forth from your Kestrel to your app and vice versa. Um, but I'm going to show you how to create a gun profile on the Kestrel itself if you don't have that, or if you're just at the range and you want to create a profile. So um, if you go to the manage guns tab, you can see I've got a bunch of guns in here already. We don't want to hit the delete all button, but the one right above it says new gun. So if you select new gun, you can see the list of inputs that come up. And I basically just go down this list. So I'm going to build a profile for my dasher and we're going to compare the data that comes out of it uh, the the profile that i create in the kestrel versus the profile that i create in the app 
I know my velocity is around 28.75. Um, I'm going to use a G7 profile. If you guys have a choice, always use a G7 profile. It's going to be more accurate than a G1 profile for the bullets that we're doing. Um, and we're going to talk about CDMs and PDMs a little bit, but this is all you can select on the actual Kestrel. So I'm going to use the 105 hybrid, which mine have been measured at 280. I know it says 275 on the box. Bullet grain weight, adjust your bullet grain weight. Oh, sorry, it goes faster. Adjust your bullet grain weight to the weight of your bullet. Bullet diameter, we're going six millimeters, so that's 243. Zero range, 100 yards, we're gonna zero at 100 yards. Um, if you guys are at a range where you don't have 100 yards zero, it's not a big deal. If it's 90 yards or if it's 120 yards, I definitely range the zero every time I go to a match just to see if it's exactly um, 100 yards. Most times it is, but sometimes you can tell that they just haphazardly set up a, um, a backer and it's not necessarily 100 yards. Um, this is the bore height, the height over bore. So this is the act from the center line of the axis of your bore up to the center line of your scope at the elevation turret. So I'll, I'll take a, a measurement and it doesn't have to be perfect, but um, you can get a pretty good measurement with a tape measure, a ruler or a scale or something like that. Mine happens to be 188, 1.88. I'll put that in there. ZH. So ZH and ZO stands for zero height and zero offset. Um, these two values would be if you shot your zero and no matter what you did, you could not get your zero, zero in your rifle to hit exactly in the center of the target. So if your zero is a half a bullet high, you're gonna adjust this to be about four tenths of a mil, sorry, 0.04 mil. Um, and then what that's gonna do is it's gonna assume that your zero is high, so all the rest of your calculations will uh, be adjusted accordingly. And we'll, we're gonna come back and review that, but this is something that I use all the time. I use it to correct my um, trajectory if I feel like my zero has shifted throughout a match and I definitely use it every time I go to the range and um, I have to zero because I don't have turrets that um, that slip infinitely so it has to be in 0 0.1 mil increments and it very rarely is my bullet ever exactly in the center of the target stop me if you guys don't understand that because that's uh, very critical um, so I'm going to put my twist rate in here. This is RT twist rate. So I got one in 7.5. Units, pretty self-explanatory elevation unit and windage unit in mills. We're not going to deal with the Cal DSF right now. And that is all we need. So the very top line is where you would call it or give it a name. So we're just going to go up there and I'll hit the center button and I can call it whatever I want. I'm going to leave it as user one so you guys don't have to watch me push the buttons, but that's how you would name it. So if I exit out of here, I can scroll up through here and I, I've got all my guns that I already had, plus I've got user gun one. Does anybody have any questions about that yet? Okay, I see a question from Chad Schultens. It says, when updating firmware, does our rifle data get deleted? Um, my experience is yes. So I don't know if it will forever, like in all the updates, but I would definitely assume that it's gonna be deleted. So back it up before you do the firmware update. Uh, Garrett, asked or at least made a comment um, talking about spin drift. So yes, spin drift is in the environmental conditions and we will get there. Um, it doesn't have to do with the gun setup yet. So now I've got the gun in here. I got it, you called user gun one. Um, so now let's talk about the app and we'll build the same thing. Oh yeah, see that button cuts. <laughs> I did find that uh, 
dumb and dumber van out in the desert one time. Um, so we're going to go to gun profile management here. And if we want to build a gun, we're going to push this plus button here. And it's going to be very similar format to what we just dealt with. So we're going to be able to put the name in here. Let's just call it. How about you two? So we can tell the difference here. Now, the only difference here is you can select from the bullet library and the bullet library has all of the known bullets with their G7 profiles or the custom drag curves or the personal drag models. So if you guys are showing up next weekend, everybody is going to get a PDM that shows up and wants to shoot it. So what that what's going to happen with that is you will shoot 10 rounds across the um, radar and Mitch or Francis or whoever is running the computer will take and it'll get the BC curve for your specific bullet in your specific barrel. Um, and it will be for the, for that specific rifle. Now it could change slightly over the life of that barrel, but that is going to be the most accurate BC curve that you could possibly have. It's going to be very similar to the custom drag model, except there'll be some unique, um, BC variations because of your specific barrel. I mean, every barrel is different. Um, but anyway, we're going to go down here. We're going to select 243. I'm using the Burger 105 hybrids. And since I know that I have a personal drag model in here, I'm just going to go down and grab it. So this is my personal drag model, CCH mod. I got the new Bartline Steel 105 hybrid. When this comes up, um, if you don't have a custom curve, you would select G7. I do, so I'm going to collect, connect to the custom curve, and you'll see that the ballistic coefficient goes to 1.0. Anytime you guys have a custom curve, it'll say 1.0 here. If you guys are overriding this, then it's basically going to have, you're going to have some issues. So leave it at 1.0 if it's the custom curve. If you choose G7, then you would put the ballistic coefficient as 2.28 like we just did if that's the bullet you're running or that's your known BC. So notice it puts the bullet diameter, the bullet weight in there for me. Um, I do have to change the muzzle velocity. I'm going to go put 2875, uh, zero range, 100 yards, height over bore, same thing, 1.88. The nice thing about dealing with the app is that everything's, nothing is abbreviated. I mean, all these words are spelled right out. So I think it's personally a little bit easier to build the profile on your phone and then upload it to the Kestrel. Um, also, then you'll have a backup of it on your phone. I usually build it on my phone is what I'm trying to say here. So I'll put 7.5 as my twist rate, units in mils, MV temp table. We're not going to mess with the MV temp table. That would be for a more advanced session here. But um, as far as a description of what that is, you would put the muzzle velocity or the temperature of your ammo, and then you would put the feet per second, and it, it, it'll build this table. And then based on your environmentals, it can adjust your um, velocities based on temperatures. So it is a useful tool. I will tell you that I've not found that it really, I really need it, but I'm not sure if you're using, uh, if you're dealing with some pretty vast or temperature sensitive powders and vast environmental conditions, you might want to mess with it. I personally don't, I don't bother with it. Um, that's up to you. So I'm going to hit save here. So I'm going to go down here and find out where it put it, U2. So I got it down here at the bottom. Um, when we get ready to send these profiles, we've got to make a connection here. So next thing we need to talk about is Bluetooth. So if you go to the settings tab, the very, the second thing from the top is Bluetooth. Right now I have it on. If you hit the center button, then you can see right now that I've got it to select um, or connect to a PC or mobile. If you hit the center button there, then you can toggle left or right and look to set. Now it says device connect. Now it's back to PC connect. If you're not connecting with your phone and your Bluetooth is on on your phone and your Bluetooth is on in your Kestrel, it's because you have it selected to device connect and not PC or mobile connect. Hopefully right. that makes sense. 
the next thing I want to say is I personally turn this privacy pin on and all that does is make it so that when you connect to this device for the first time, it makes you have to put in this pin number. Um, I've had two people in my experience um, that have had their data overwritten by somebody else at a match because they were walking around at a match with this Bluetooth on and this privacy setting off. Because somebody is trying to push data from their phone to their Kestrel and there's a bunch of numbers on their screen and they just click that they want to connect to any old Kestrel and then they send six Creedmoor data into somebody's six BRA profile and somebody's <laughs> missing targets <laughs> and they're not happy. Um, it happened to a buddy of mine at the barrel maker last year. So I don't want that to happen to you guys. So I, I do two methods of protection here. I usually leave this pin on and then I also turn the Bluetooth off when I'm not using it. So if I want to connect, I got my app on, I got my Bluetooth on, I make sure that I go to this tab that says PC mobile and I should be connected. Let me just make sure here. I'm going to reopen this. Device connect. And you can see my Kessler right there. As soon as I hit it, it's going to try to connect. Authenticated, ready to rock. So now if I want to send the profile from my, Kestrel, from my app to my Kestrel, I go down to the bottom here. Actually, I go down and find it. It's right there. Um, I'm going to hit the select button. I'm going to select that profile. And then I'm going to hit send profiles. Now, here's the important thing. You guys might want to come back and rewatch this or take a note. If you hit overwrite right now, it will overwrite the Kestrel with only the selected items on your phone. And right now, I only have the YouTube profile selected. So it is only going to send you two to my phone and then, or my Kestrel, and there will be nothing else on it. And you'll be really sad. So if you hit that overwrite button, you will only have you two profile on here. What you want to select when you're going from your phone to your Kestrel is append if you just want to add. So I'm going to hit append. It's sending. All right. I'm going to go back here. And you two is in my Kestrel now. But if you notice, if I toggle to the right, user gun is still in there. My Dasher PDM is still in there. My ATIP Dasher is still in there. So it did not get rid of any of my other profiles. Does that make sense? Oh, I got a question here. Do you take both phone and Kestrel to match? Um, I guess the answer to that question is, do you go anywhere without your phone? I don't. <laughs> um, I would always have it. Um, for a couple reasons. I, I like to have access to this app, but I also like to have applied ballistics on my phone as a backup plan in case something happens. So if you guys don't have the applied ballistics app, I highly recommend it. I think it's like 30 bucks and it does a very similar thing to what the Kestrel does, except it does not have the weather meter part of it. So you have to put the environmentals in, but if somebody else next to you has a Kestrel, you can put the environmentals in the Kestrel or the applied ballistics app. And then you've got basically the same thing. Um, I'm all about having redundant information because this stuff is so critical that um, you can't compete without it basically. Uh, Rudy asks, is this different if we are using Fordoff? Yes, Fordoff is a totally different solver. Do you only have, do you only use the AB app on your phone or others like Shooter, Straylock, Ballistics, Arc? Um, yes, I only use Applied Ballistics because um, I believe in the product and the amount of adjustability it gives me. Um, I've been to the lab, I've seen uh, how they test data and how data driven they are. I, I can shake hands with the people that created this software and um, it's a Michigan company and I believe in the work that they're doing. So um, long story short, is it the only solver out there? No, um, but I trust it. So that's a, tr a long answer to a short question. Um, so once you've got the profiles in here, you can modify the profile. 
Um, let's say I'm going to modify U2 and my, it turns out I go to the range and I use my chronograph and my new velocity is 2891. Um, I've done all my work for the day. I want to um, capture this and save it. So now what I want to do is take this in my Kestrel and I want to send it back to the app so that I have it backed up uh, and make sure that I have current information in the app. So if you want to do that, then you have to go, you have to hit select. I'm sorry, you have to hit this get profiles button. Sorry, I got a lot of profiles. All right, maybe I shouldn't have done that. It's going through all my profiles. You can see it changing here. Okay. So once I hit get profiles and go back here, find you two. Right, I got a bunch of profiles on here. Uh, it doesn't look like it's sent it with the current data. I think that I had it turned off to not overwrite. I will I will come back to you guys on that one. Um, basically, what I was told from Kestrel and Applied Ballistics was, if you're sending profiles from your Kestrel to your app, you want to overwrite instead of append. So I don't want to get you guys confused on that. Um, I will put a comment in here once we post the video of the exact language. But if you go from the cast from the app to the Kestrel, you would like to append your profiles. And when you go the other way, you want to overwrite your profiles because you want the current data from your Kestrel to be stored over top of your um, data that's in your app. And it will not delete all the other profiles like it does when you go the other direction. So it's slightly confusing and I don't want to get you guys um, doing the wrong thing. So let me just put it in text when we post the video and we'll make sure that everybody's on the same page. Um, yes. Jason also makes a comment about the elite version versus the regular version of the Kestrel. So there's uh, quite a few differences between the elite version and the regular version. Um, one of the main differences is how many profiles you can store or use. Um, and the second thing that um, really stands out to me is you have access to PDMs and CDMs and you don't have that access in, um, without the elite model. Um, okay, so now we've got a profile in there and let's go back and talk about the rest of the inputs. Um, the very next thing below your gun, uh, I'm going to use the U2 profile that we just created, is the environmental tab. So let's click the center button and go into the environment and you see lock. Um, what does that mean? That means that we're not capturing environmental data. Um, I see that this is a problem with a lot of new users is they will push this right arrow and have it say live because they think that they want to gather live environmental data um, continuously. That's not the case. If you leave this on live and you put this in your pocket, um, or next to your body and it gathers body heat and humidity and it's gonna give you a different solution. Um, or if you have it sitting in the sun versus in the shade, you can get different temperatures. So what you wanna do is you wanna capture the environmental data and then you wanna turn this off and lock it. Um, recommended by Kestrel is to turn it on live and then I can't do it in this setting, but grab it by the lanyard, which I, I have it um, off of it right now, but you'll grab it by the lanyard and you'll swing it around in the air. You've seen people doing that. What that's going to do is that's going to purge the air around the sensor here, and that's going to give you a, a representative sample of the environment. Um, if you have it in your hand, I would hold it down low here like this so that your hand isn't putting heat up into that sensor as well. Um, so once you've captured the environmentals, you're going to hit lock. Very next thing in here is latitude. Latitude, um, the latitude setting is going to account for your Coriolis effect. So there's two things that, that happen. Um, there, there's two components to Coriolis. There's vertical and horizontal. 
latitude takes care of one and your direction of fire takes care of the other. So make sure that you put your current latitude in here. It's not really gonna matter if you're shooting a four or 500 yard shot, but if you're shooting a 1, 1,000, 1,500 yards, you're gonna wanna have your uh, correct latitude. So get an app on your phone or you can use the Kestrel app. The app here actually has a function in one of the menus that you can push the current latitude from your phone because it has a GPS in it back to the Kestrel. Um, we're not going to review that right now, but it's I, I just use my my watch or my uh, phone and put the latitude in there. This also displays the temperature, barometric pressure, relative humidity. And if you guys aren't familiarized with density altitude, that's basically the composition of all three of those variables um, into a number that is a single number. Um, I'll write this down if I go to the range day so that whatever my real dope is for the day has... Um, has some reference point to it. And then if I show up to the range on another day that has the same density altitude, I know that I can use that same hard data. Um, this is where you can turn on and off spin drift right here. You just arrow over. Um, I can't understand why anybody would wanna turn it off um, unless they don't believe that it's real. And it, there's definitely, it, it is real. So um, make sure that you've got spin drift on. That's my opinion. Um, wind capture. So this is whether you want it to capture all targets or just one target. You definitely want it to capture on all targets if we're going to use multiple targets. The safest thing is to have this on all targets. Um, and that's all the environmental uh, aspects that you can control. Next thing we're going to go down to is wind. Let's find the wind tab here. Um, actually, let's talk about target direction. So you will have... Um, once you've calibrated your Kestrel, it will allow you to gather target direction. So this red button right here in the top is how you gather your target direction. And you're gonna hold the Kestrel so that it's facing towards the direction of your target and you're staring at the screen. You're gonna push this red button. Notice the little arrow that pops up right next to the T. That means that you're capturing. So you're gonna hold this as steady as you can in the direction of the target. And then you're gonna push this button again. Now it says the direction of fire is 286 degrees. That's all you need to do. That will take care of your other component of Coriolis. Um, the next thing you're gonna wanna do is gather your wind. So pretty self-explanatory. You're gonna gather wind with this anemometer, I think it's called. Um, same concept. You are going to push this red button and that's gonna start capturing your wind. Now, same concept. You want this screen to be facing you and you want to aim this into the wind. I'll hang my lanyard down from here. I don't have it on here right now, but, um, and I'll use the lanyard, um, the wind blowing the lanyard towards me. And that's how I know that it's um, facing directly into the wind. I'm just going to blow into this thing real quick so that I can get some wind captured and then we'll do something with that in a minute. Hello. As soon as you push that button, it's going to capture the direction and the last five seconds of wind is gonna be averaged and put into wind one. This is wind one right here, and this is wind two. So you wanna gather at least five seconds of wind. I try to get 30 seconds roughly, just so that I can stare at this thing and, and see what the wind is doing going up and down. Um, sorry, looking at another question here. Um, if you push the center button, you can go into the wind table and notice you can manually adjust your wind direction. Um, you can also change whether it's in degrees or in clock angle. So if I change it to clock, it'll say 1030. And that is reference to what your target direction was. So if you gathered, if you gathered your target direction straight ahead and your wind was off at 45 degrees, then this should say 130. It's just, um, it's just gathering a reference angle from where you gathered the wind. I personally like to use degrees because it's a more finer increment. Um, if you've got wind at 1230 and you know it's much closer to 12 than 1230, then you can go in here and you can manually adjust this. Even, even if you captured it and it's showing at 360 degrees, you can force it to be five degrees because you know it's a right to left wind and you don't want to accept that you're not going to do anything about that wind. I'll manually override this to something. 
Um, you can also manually override the wind speed. And as I said before, the wind speed one that's default in here is going to be the last five second average of the wind capture function. And then the wind speed two is always defaulted to what the peak wind speed was during the whole time that you were capturing. That's why I try to capture 30 seconds or so of wind. I got a comment here from Dick saying, truing your elevation with barometer. Um, I don't worry too much about what my actual altitude is, if that's what you're talking about. Um, I, I just take whatever the density altitude says and I'll roll with it. I've got charts for hard data every um, 500 and um, every 500 DA increment. And then I'll use that if I need hard dope. Uh, I don't use a lot of hard dope anymore because I have this uh, Kestrel HUD and it can pull um, data from the Kestrel in table format really quickly. Uh, I'll show you that if you guys, if we have time for that. Um, we're approaching 40 minutes right now, so I need to pick it up. Um, so that's basically all I do to capture environmentals and wind. Um, we built a gun, we captured environmentals, got the target direction. So at this point, now you can go all the way up to the top of the target card here and adjust your range. So say you got a 780 yard shot, we're gonna get this thing to say 780 yards. And then the elevation will be displayed up top. Your wind for an average wind hold is gonna be 0.2 left. And the um, peak wind, Uh, that doesn't make oh because we got spin drift um so yeah that's why the peak wind is less than the actual wind here when, on a low wind scenario um so i i get a lot of questions about aerodynamic jump um and i don't know if you guys are familiar with aerodynamic jump um but basically it's a concept of when the bullet leaves the barrel um on a right hand twist barrel and the wind is coming from the right to the left the bullet wants to climb the wind. And I used to think that it was, um, I used to think that it was a continuous climb across the bullet's trajectory. But then after talking to the guys that applied ballistics, they explained it more of literally a jump at the muzzle. And I have witnessed this many times um, at a hundred yard zero. So that's how I know that it's more at the muzzle than across its whole trajectory. So I will tell you guys, it's a real thing. And I hear a lot of people say, well, I don't put anything in wind one because wind one um, will add the aerodynamic jump to my elevation. And I say, good, that's what you want it to do. So make sure that you have your best estimate of what the wind is in wind one on your Kestrel. Don't zero it out, leave it in there. And you can do a little test at the range. Um, what I'll do is if I've got a, if I've got a pretty heavy wind on day one, what I'll do is I'll go to on zero day, I'll go and I'll put this at 100 yards. And I'll see what it's telling me to do as far as wind hold. So right now, I've got a little bit of right to left wind. I'm going to change it to a more significant value. Let's put a 90 degree wind in here. Five mile an hour. So look what it's telling me to do. It's telling me to hold under by 0.8 mils because it knows that my bullet is gonna impact high. And I would tell you guys, go test this for yourself. Go, go zero your rifle on a zero wind day and then take it out very next day if you know it's gonna be windy, uh, either from the three o'clock or the nine o'clock position. See what the Kestrel tells you to hold and then see where your bullet impacts on the paper. And you will be surprised how much your bullet can be shifted by the wind, even in a hundred yards. Um, so does anybody have any questions on that? Uh, let me hear, I see here. Okay. Um, let's talk a little bit about the range card and, and all the information on the range card. So if you have a single target engagement, most of the time I'll just go up here and adjust the yardage on here. 
and it'll display what my elevation needs to be. Um, but if I have a bunch of unknown distances and I want to have a quick access to a range card, that's what the range card is for. So if you push the center button on the range card, you can change the increment because um, a lot of times 100 yards is not sufficient. I'll do it in maybe 25 yard increments. And as you toggle down here, the reason it takes a little while is because it's actually doing the calculations when you push this button. So let's call it a 400 yard shot. And the left or right arrows here will take you through the different functions of this table. So you can see you've got at 400 yards, you've got uh, 0.07 mils of spin drift. Here's your horizontal Coriolis, wind one, wind two, lead this is for movers if we get time we'll talk about that but um, if the match director gives you a, a mile per hour in um, a mover speed and you put that in the target then it's this is where your lead is going to show up so there's there's a lot of voodoo um, that people want to say or talk about when it comes to movers but it's really as simple as this it's it's how long does it take your bullet to get to the target and then how much um, how many mills do you need to hold to counteract that? And this table is never wrong. Um, when I hear people saying they're holding 1.5 mills at 400 yards for this particular scenario, I would say the only way that 1.5 would get you to center is because of your brain to your trigger finger reaction time. The math doesn't lie. It's a 1.7 to the center of the target uh, at 400 yards for this specific, specific scenario. So, um, I encourage you guys to go out and shoot some movers if you have time. Um, it will build confidence and then you'll see whether you're a quick trigger puller or a slow one and you'll be able to take this number and either add or subtract to it. Um, but this is the real number. If that bullet left the barrel when you wanted it to, 1.7 hold would smash the center of the target at 400 yards. Uh, TRCE, that stands for trace. So on a 400 yard shot, it's telling you if you look 1.2 mils above the center of your reticle, that's going to be the max orbit of your bullet, and that's your best chance of seeing trace. Um, it doesn't take into account the fact that the rifle is recoiling, um, but if you if you fix your eye 1.2 mils above your reticle, um, and you and your rifle doesn't move, you would see trace uh, right in that region. It's pretty cool. I've tried it a bunch of times, and it works. Um, remaining velocity category. This is this is pretty interesting for um, seeing where you're going into the transonic range or the subsonic range. So if I scroll down here, it starts to. You can see the bullet start to slow down, and we know the transonic range is coming up anytime now. So um, you see the little bullet point there. That's in the transonic range where you should start to be concerned about bullet stability. And then once you see a full size asterisk, like on the 1375, that is actually subsonic. Um, when we talk about truing, we're gonna to wanna to go right before the transonic range. I usually go about 90%. So somewhere in here, 1050, 1100 would be good for this projectile. You know you're not gonna be into the transonic range, um, but you're out there quite a, a good distance. Um, let's see here. Okay, so we've went through the range card. Let's just make sure there's nothing else in the range card that's interesting here. Remaining energy, this could be good for hunters. Um, if you want to have a certain amount of energy to kill an animal, or sometimes guides will require you to have a certain amount of remaining energy or energy in general. Um, that's a useful column to have. Time and flight, and we're back to spin drift. Um, so the next question I get once you've built this range card is how do I, how do I adjust it if my data doesn't line up? Um, I'm thinking that you guys have been to the range before and um, you go shoot a thousand yards or 800 yards or whatever, and whatever's in your cast roll, whatever is telling you doesn't match up with what actually is required on your rifle. Um, I will say, I go back and check all of these inputs. If that is the case, I'm gonna assume that it's me 
and that it's not solution. So I'll go back to the main menu. I will go to my gun profile and I'll quadruple check all of these measurements, all these inputs. Um, the next thing I'm gonna do is make sure everything tight on my rifle. I mean, simple we weapons maintenance. Um, if you guys haven't done a scope tracking test, it's probably a good idea to do it on every scope, whether it costs $500 or $5,000. Um, any scope tracking issues could and will end up in your elevation. Um, you need to make sure you know the range of your target. Um, a thousand yards, a lot of rangefinders have a hard time. So um, how do you know that a thousand yards is actually accurate? Make sure that your target range is accurate. Um, next thing is I'll make that my muzzle velocity is accurate. I'll, if I haven't measured my muzzle velocity that day, I will measure it and make sure that it's it's put into my Kestrel properly. Um, the other thing is the target direction. So we know Coriolis matters. Um, and if you don't have the proper target direction or the proper latitude in there, then you could have elevation or windage issues as well. So you can see that there's so many variables that add up to why your elevation could be off a couple tenths that you need to really understand what makes them, um, what makes up your elevation and to understand that um, any inaccuracies are probably not in the data. It's probably either in the input of that data or the accuracy of your scope tracking or the fact that you didn't capture environmentals. Make sure you have the current mental data. Um, so let's say you've checked all those things because we know we've checked all those things, right? Um, we know everything. If, if you have no other option, then you're going to have to go to the calibrate um, muzzle velocity function. And um, the calibrate muzzle velocity function, if you guys haven't done that before, it's going to force you to make your velocity a certain amount so that it lines up at that distance. So pick your 90% and go through your calibrate muzzle velocity. If you are trying to true up outside of your um, transonic or subsonic zone and you're past subsonic, then you need to use the Cal DSF function. Um, it might be a little, it might be a little difficult to go through that here, but I can go through that with you guys at the range because I think it, it might take a little bit too much time. But um, if you guys haven't done that before, you can message me and I'll make sure I go through it with you. But I, I would definitely strongly urge you guys to, to question whether you have all the inputs right first before you go and do something like that. Um, so I guess, what other questions do we have? Do we have some open here? Do you true BC just before trans and velocity at 600? Um, I don't true BC. I use a BC that's known and then I'll true my muzzle velocity um, because that my experience is that even if your muzzle velocity has to be adjusted 40, 50 feet per second of, of what you think you know is true based on your device, um, the solution always ends up better than if I start some with BC. Um, I would also urge you to play with your muzzle velocity and your BC and see what it does to your elevation. It takes quite a bit um, to get those things to have a have a realistic effect on your elevation. So to me that what that makes me say is um, it makes me think that I need to make sure that there's not some other input. Like usually it's something else. It's um, a target direction. It's a wind direction uh, that's wrong, or you don't have any wind in there at all, but there's a 15 mile an hour wind, something along those lines. Um, so I will say that I really, I have never used the Cal muzzle velocity function. Um, and I've never used the, the drop scale function. It's always lined up for me. I've seen people use it. I've helped people use it but I would definitely urge you to um, go through all the inputs and make sure that it's right first. Um, the cool thing about next weekend is you'll get a PDM. So you'll know for sure that your BC is accurate. And inside of transonic range, 
then VC is really all you need. I mean, you could you could start up a G7 profile and it's going to be very close to your PDM if you have the exact G7 for your bullet or for your bullet. How many rounds do you use to get your target muzzle velocity? 10 rounds through chronograph and take an average. Um, personally, I I know what my muzzle velocity should be when I show up to the range. It, it's it's expected. Um, and I'll just do a few because my SDs are usually in the five to seven range max. So as long as I shoot two or three, I, I know it's going to be representative. And like I said, if you adjust your muzzle velocity 10, 20 feet per second, it really doesn't have a huge effect on your, uh, your data for PRS type ranges. Um, but if I don't know the velocity or I'm doing low development, I'm definitely doing 10, 20 rounds and I'm going to, I'm going to take that average most velocity and that's what I'm going to put in my solution from the beginning. Um, so the off topic. Uh, yes. Um, you can use the cable with a non-link Kestrel. I just don't have the cable. Um, I've always used the link, but it works the same way. You can send it directly with the cable. Uh, when Kestrel says to dial for wind left or right, are we dialing the scope in the same direction or the opposite? So if it says left, then you're going to dial your scope to the left. Um, if you're holding, then you're holding left of target. So yes. Um, okay. So I think those are the questions unless I missed any. So we're, we're getting towards the hour here. Um, you guys have my contact information. I want to do the, the giveaway. I want to also give you guys a checklist of what I do on match day. So I basically showed you the ins and outs of all the stuff that you use to set up a profile and adjust it. But there's a ritual that I do when I show up to a match and it's the same every single time to make sure that I have the correct inputs into the Kestrel and that I'm set up for success. Because like I said, the overall goal of this session was to make sure that you have 100% confidence in your data when you get on that line and you know that your elevation is correct. Um, the worst thing is if you don't have confidence in that data and then you don't have a great wind call and you're questioning whether it's a wind issue or an elevation issue, I don't want to have either one of those. Um, so the first thing I do when I show up to a match is I figure out what the latitude is for the match. I'll put that latitude in my environment. Next thing is I'll calibrate the compass. Like I said, and whenever I move, locations whenever i load put it away in my bag i'm going to calibrate that compass you want to do it away from a big metal structures because it could influence it so i'll go out in the middle of the parking lot i'll stand there like a dummy and just spin around normally i just spin my whole body because it's fun um, then you're going to want to capture the environmental data by swinging the kestrel around in live mode and turn it off um, i always 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 measure my muzzle velocity at a match um, they're going to have a zero, a place for you to zero. I want to know my muzzle velocity at that location. I'm just, it's just a superstitious thing for me. I want to know the exact muzzle velocity. And then I want to shoot a zero. If I can shoot a zero the day before, good. If I can't, I'll get it that morning. Uh, what I'm looking for in the zero is I'm looking for exactly where my point of impact is. Um, and I'm going to adjust that point of impact in my Kestrel for that ZH and the ZO function in my gun profile. So I want to show you guys that one more time. I'm going to go into the gun. Oh, my bad. Hold on. That's okay. I'm going to, I'm going to go from the main menu. Let me know when you guys can see it. You're good now. Okay. I'm going to go into the main menu here. I'm going to select the gun and I'm going to go down and go to that Z zero Z H. So ZH is zero height. So if I am impacting half a tenth high, then it's got to be half a tenth high or half a tenth low, right? Because I'm going to, if I go down, I'm going to be low. If I go up, I'm going to be above. So you just got to pick one. I usually default to just above center if I have to. So I'm going to say my impact is half a mil high. Um, and say, if I have to pick left or right, because it's not impacting perfectly center, I'm going to impact left because of spin drift. I want to at least try to cancel out a little bit of spin drift. So um, if I have to impact left or right, then I'll adjust it here. 
then I'll go back to the main menu and put this at 100 yards and see if it makes sense. I just always want to double check. So we said we were going to want to impact high and left if we weren't on center. And this is telling me to go down 0.1 mil. And it's telling me to go right 0.1 mil. So that makes sense, right? Because we our bullet impacts are to the left. And this has been calibrated for our zero height and zero offset. So we are set to go. Um, I, I do want to give a slight disclaimer on zero. It's not really part of this class um, because it's not Kestrel related, but I am always very cautious to move my zero at a match. Uh, if I feel like I need to, I'm going to ask myself a few things. Like, am I zeroing in high mirage condition? It, is it a high sun condition or is it cloudy? Um, is it windy? Am I on an incline? Like all these things can affect your zero. So if you know your zero was good when you left your home and you didn't bang around your rifle, like I'm very, very cautious. It has burned me more times than it's helped me to adjust my zero to match. I just want to give you guys that disclaimer because all those things will affect your zero. But if you choose to adjust your zero and it's not on center, then that's what I do. I'll adjust my zero height and my zero offset in my Kestrel. And then the last thing you want to do if you have the opportunity is verify your data at distance. Sometimes they'll have it set up at a match where you can, you know, shoot at distance and double check everything. And that always just gives me a good warm fuzzy to, to be able to make sure that my stuff is tracking. Um, okay. So I think that's all the questions. If you're scanning through those, Amanda, and you see any critical ones that I missed, let me know and I'll, I'll pick them away. Um, otherwise let's do the, um, Let's do the giveaway real quick here. Before you do that, really I quick, I, I want to just also point out to um, everyone here, if you go follow um, Kestrel Ballistics on Facebook or go to their website and subscribe to their emails, they send out um, information about online classes that they offer. Um, and they offer like five or six of them a month that you that are free it's the same kind of setting um, and Katie and Austin uh, from Kestrel, they will also do this kind of class. They do it over and over and over again. Um, I work at Applied Ballistics and I probably take one of those Kestrel classes at least once a month. Um, I'm not an expert shooter. I'm learning as well, but um, doing these kinds of things over and over and over again can only help you. Absolutely. I mean, that's kind of why I want to volunteer to go through this too. Cause I mean, explaining it over and over again helps me too. Right. Um, well, well, and it's, it's a bonus when you know the person who's doing it, but, um, right. Anyways, that's um, yeah, there's a few other things in here that I use quite often that we, we don't necessarily have time for, but, um, we'll just, I'll just say so that you know that they exist. Um, the target card is an expansion of, of the target, the single target mode. So you can set up 10 targets on here and you can be able to view all 10 targets on the target card, which is pretty critical if you've got targets in different directions. So you can capture one wind direction and then um, multiple target directions and it's going to spread that wind across all of those targets with respect to that direction from that location. And I'll use that in a PRS match when there's a, maybe a, a 120 degree range fan of targets from left to right, like there was last weekend. I know you know what I'm talking about, Rich. That was insane. Um, <laughs> and so you got um, you got to deal with the wind direction changing, and it's not really changing. You're just changing your direction of fire. So um, it's a little bit more advanced. We can get into that uh, maybe in another session or on a sidebar, or grab me and I'll I'll show you guys how I deal with that. Um, the other thing is, um, do, do we, I, I want to show you this. Let me just do this real quick. Let me switch you back. So in the, in the target tab, when you go to target, there's the angle. So if you guys are shooting in the mountains on a hunt, you can put the inclination angle in here in degrees, and that will adjust your elevation accordingly. Um, and the cool thing about that is when you go back to the main screen, you see that little asterisk. That means that you have angle built into your solution. So if you ever see that 
um, and you don't want it, it's a reminder, hey, I got to go back in here and change and pull this out. Um, it's a really, uh, it's a useful tool in the mountains. And the other thing is target speed. So this is where you would put your mover in there. Um, lots of times matches will have movers at three miles an hour. That's pretty standard. But um, say you have a mover at 600 yards, you would put three mile per hour in here, and then you would go to your range card and you would go down into the 600 yard range and scroll over until you get to the target speed. And that's all you do. Lead right there. So your lead for a, a three mile an hour mover is 1.84 to center a target at 600 yards um, and you will hit. So um, I can go into um, how to measure movers and stuff like that. It's a little more advanced skill, but it's pretty easy. And then I can go to the target card. If I run into you guys at the range and you guys want to do it. Um, I don't use it all the time, but it's something useful. So let me pull up uh, random here and we will get that going. While Chad's pulling that up, um, any of you that are coming to the train up day uh, next Saturday at MTC, if you did not get an email from me earlier this week, please check your spam folder. Um, I sent out some information about getting your PDMs. Um, if you did not find that, um, can you maybe email me? Uh, my email address is amanda.wheeler at LLC.com. Rich, I see your comment. Why don't you email me that as well? And I'll talk to Nate and see what that looks like. Um, and I'll type my email in the chat here so that you guys can write it down. Um, and one can other you thing... Sharing? On While you're talking screen? To you yeah. Yeah. Um, just also, I think we're going to send an email out, but for that train up day on Saturday, you'll need about 50 rounds of ammo. You'll need 10 of it for your PDM. And then there's a couple of live fire stages that we're going to do. Um, so heads up. Cool. I don't think it's allowing me to share yet. Oh, I don't know what I did here. Hold on. Uh, Dave, to answer your question about the um, pushing the targets from your phone to your Kestrel, uh, I don't think that's possible. Um, the app and the HUD are dumb devices. They basically slave off of the data that's in the Kestrel, the, the computations that are coming out of the Kestrel. So you have to set your target card up in the, um, the Kestrel itself and then it'll pull from the Kestrel. I was just gonna show you guys connecting to the HUD here while she was waiting, but um, looks like we got this screen share. Nope, it says disabled participant screen sharing. No, we can see you. You can see my screen? Yes. I, I wanna share, I wanna share um, the random thing. Oh, on your see, computer. Yeah. So on the very bottom, if you hit screen share. Yeah, it says host disabled participant screen sharing. Well, one moment, I thought I made you a co-host. All right, so you guys can see here, um, I've got in the HUD, I've got a bunch of different options um, of the different screens here, but I can toggle through. This is the actual target card. And the, the HUD right now is pinging my Kestrel to see what I have in the target card. And it's gonna display all the targets with elevation and windage. This is the same way that the app would work in the phone. Um, you would have to pull from, you would have to select on the phone to pull from the Kestrel and it would go through and pull the target card. For frequently asked questions, product sheets, and user guides, head over to the Applied Ballistics website, AppliedBallisticsLLC.com. If you enjoyed this video, smash that like button. And if you'd like to see more videos like this, hit the subscribe button and the notification bell to stay up to date with the latest content from Applied Ballistics. Thanks for watching.